So this is our look at Federalist number 20, part 1. Again, uh, Federalists 18, 19, and 20, James Madison and Hamilton focus on the history of ancient and modern confederacies to remind Americans that all the confederacies of the past have been awful or have not been good and it has led to wars, chaos, anarchy, and they go through the list and as you remember, I told you uh, Madison had prepared that memoranda in 1786 um, on ancient and modern confederacies. And he also prepared vices of the political system of the U.S. in 1787. Uh, so here he focuses so much on what he's read over here and uh, reminds the audience, reminds the readers that if we do not stay united, we, like the rest of these confederacies, whether, like he says in Federalist number 18, whether it's Greece or whether in number 19 he focuses on the Germanic confederacies, or here in number 20, he focuses on Netherlands. And when he says United Netherlands, keep in mind, this part is important, keep in mind that Netherlands, uh, some people call it Holland. I know uh, I'm a Farsi speaker, so we call it Holland. But Holland is, was just one of the major provinces of the seven provinces that had shaped United Netherlands. And uh, it's important to remember that United Netherlands had been struggling to get their independence from Spain, the Catholic Spain. The United Netherlands, for the most part, were Protestants. So it, <clears throat> it is reminding the readers in America that, look, these guys in Netherlands, these people have republics just like ours. Drop. They are mostly Protestant just like ours. They don't want to have anything to do with these Catholic forces and monarchies like French, the French and the Spanish. And we need to look at how they are doing with their confederacy and learn a lesson. See, whether they are doing well, whether they are prospering, whether they are weak, and we can learn from them. So he focuses here mostly on Netherlands, United Netherlands. So keep in mind, United Netherlands has seven parts. When they get their independence, the southern part breaks away. They're mostly Catholics in the south and they, uh, they end up composing Belgium, what is now Belgium, and the northern part stays united under, depending on what country you come from, Holland or United Netherlands. So keep that in mind, they are republics. He's going to say it here. So let me start reading this. Uh, the United Netherlands are a confederacy of republics or rather of aristocracies, of a very remar remarkable texture. Notice remarkable does not have the same meaning as it does, that it does now. Yet confirming all the lessons derived from those which we have already reviewed. First of all, notice when he says United Netherlands are, it does, he doesn't say United Netherlands is, because they were not shaped yet into a union. They were a confederacy. 
and even in the United States, up to the time of the Civil War, they would always say United States are. They would not say United States is. So keep in mind, that's why over on top it says United Netherlands are a confederacy of republics. Okay, I'll go to paragraph two. The union is composed of seven co-equal and sovereign states. And each state or province is a composition of equal and independent cities. In all important cases, not only the provinces, but the cities must be unanimous. The sovereignty of the union is represented by the states general, consisting usually of about 50 deputies appointed by the provinces. They hold their seats, some for life, some for six, three, and one years. From two provinces, they continue in appointment during pleasure. So notice it says, they have a states general. It's almost like their parliament or Congress. 50, they have 50 deputies representatives and they come from these seven provinces and some of them serve for life, some of them serve for six years, some of them for three, some for one. And he says even there are two of them that the deputy serves at during pleasure, which means they can be recalled anytime. Remember one of the things that we talked about, uh, uh, the beauty of a well-established republic is a uh, independ independence judiciary when judges are independent. And remember when we talked about them earlier, I said they are going to serve during good behavior, which means they can serve all their life, literally till they die. But when you say during pleasure, you're talking during the pleasure of somebody, a king, a prince, a governor, so they can be taken off the bench, the judicial bench anytime. So keep that in mind. The states general have authority to enter into treaties and alliances to make war and peace, to raise armies and equip fleets, to ascertain quotas, quotas and demand contributions. In all these cases, however, unanimity and the sanction of their constituents are requisite. Remember, unanimity means every member had to accept and agree. If one member did not, then the deal would not work. They have authority to appoint and receive ambassadors, to execute treaties and alliances already formed, to provide for the collection of duties on imports and exports, to regulate the mint with a saving to the provincial rights, to govern as sovereigns the dependent territories. The provinces are restrained, unless with the general consent, from entering into foreign treaties, from establishing imposts injurious to others, or charging their neighbors with higher duties than their own subjects. A council of state, a chamber of accounts, with five colleges, colleges of admiralty, aid and fortify the federal administration. The executive magistrate of the union is the stockholder, who is now a hereditary prince. His principal weight and influence in the republic are derived from his independent title, 
from his great patrimonial states, from his family connections with some of the chief potentates of Europe, and more than all, perhaps, from his being stadtholder in the several, several provinces, as well as for the union in which provincial quality he has the appointment of town magistrates under certain provincial, under, under certain regulations, executes, executes provincial decrees, presides when he pleases in the provincial tribunals, and has throughout the power of pardon.